Hey everybody, it's Sean with The Good Dog, and I want to cover the vast array of tools that we use in our program. Um, you guys might use something else. There might be something better for you or your dog. That's fine. What I want to share with you is what we use and why. And then you can maybe make some uh, insightful decisions based on what I'm sharing here and go from there. So let's start off prong collars. Ah, prong collars. So this is a 2.25 and this is a 3.0, okay? So these are the only sizes that we use. We use 2.25s for small to medium dogs. Typically cutoff point is like, say 40, 45 pound dogs for this. Because <clears throat> what I find is that when the dogs get too heavy, if, if they're actually putting some pressure on these that I find, and I could be crazy, but I find that these have some flex because the gauge in these are uh, so thin. And so you get less pop uh, when you go to actually share pressure with them. So that's a 2.25, this is 3.0. And even though people with giant dogs wanna go for giant prong collars, you don't need them. The 3.0 is more than enough and it doesn't take up a huge amount of real estate and actually works better on your dog than a giant monstrous like Tyrannosaurus Rex like size prong collar. Now, that all said, when dogs go home from our program, these are what we use when we're training them. When dogs go home from our, and, and if you were just using a prong collar, let me clarify. Um, when dogs go home from our training program, they're fully e-collar trained, and so they're only using a prong on the walk. And in which case, almost without exception, we use the 2.25, because we're going to be relying almost exclusively on the e-collar, and the prong collar will, will be just there for backup and directional guidance, in which case you'll just need a little bit of reminder and the 2.25 is more than enough <clears throat> and takes up less real estate on the dog's neck. Yay, less real estate. So for any of you folks who are not going to be doing e-collar training but are struggling with your dog on walks um, with general behavior, the prong collar is a really inexpensive way to go about getting your dog to walk nicely, and you can even use it inside the house with your dog dragging a leash, so on and so forth, only when you're supervising your dog, of course. But they're a very inexpensive way to go about starting the training process, and it might be all you need. Um, and there's tons and tons of tutorial videos on how to size them and how to use them properly. So, that's prong collars. Okay, so here we have an e-collar. This is what we typically, it even says TGD on it, in case you were confused where you're, who you're watching. So this is a mini educator by e-collar technologies. Um, this is the receiver. This is the transmitter if we're going to be technical. And these are what we use on about 99% mm, of dogs. Some dogs that are uh, tremendously insensitive or have incredibly high drive, um, incredibly stubborn, then we'll go to a boss. Um, a boss is um, a slightly bigger version of both of these, uh, longer distance and higher stem levels available. Um, so <clears throat> those would be for your stubborn, more challenging dogs, but these work almost always for the dogs that we need. Now, if you're looking for off-leash reliability with recall, um, having your dog always come back to you under distraction. If you're looking in, in the outside world, if you're looking to have your dog be amazingly well behaved and responsive inside your house, because dogs can be inside your house and still know you're on the couch and they're across the room and I'm not really into coming, you can still enforce rules. You can also use them for a ton of different things as far as interior wise, trash digging, counter surfing, things like that. Um, poop eating if you're talking about outside stuff, digging holes, fence fighting. So they have a lot of, a lot of uses in a strict kind of aversive sense, but then there's a, an incredibly wide array of approaches that you can use for very amazing, awesome, full training approach with these if that makes any sense. Um, so this is what all of our clients go home on, well, their dogs actually, go home on for interior work and 
interior meaning inside the house and outside in the backyard and on walks along with prong collars. So, and that's very controversial for a lot of folks. We use prong collars and e-collars on the walks. Reason is, ask yourself a simple question. Is your client going to be, or is your owner going to be, or if you are the owner, are you going to be safer, safer? And is your dog going to be safer, safer with an e-collar and a prong collar? E-collar for all sorts of communication, for for position, for not loading up on triggers and things like that, but the prong collar for ease of directional uh, guidance, um, also for safety. If something surprises you or your dog, a cat flies out, doesn't fly out, it runs out, a squirrel jams out in front of you, a car backfires, something like that, and or a, you know a dog comes flying up off leash. Do you want to have the most control of your dog or not? It's, to me, it's, it's a no-brainer. So all of our clients for the walks, their dogs, go home with e-collar as the primary tool, but a prong as a backup for safety. So, and also there's a micro-educator. So I talked about the Boss and I talked about the Mini that we use a lot. We also do use the micro for smaller dogs, um, a little bit of a smaller receiver. Uh, I think the transmitter is the same size, pretty sure but the stem is slightly reduced. So for very sensitive dogs, whereas the boss is for the more insensitive, the very sensitive dogs, then I would suggest a micro or the very small dogs. You can also get stem reducers if you want to, um, if your dog's super, super sensitive and you need them to be less so. Here's the much maligned bonker, the, the, the bonker around the world. So this is, <laughs> This is our version of it, which is a completely unofficial as far as the um, authorities go, because there should be rubber bands. And um, we actually like them with tape around them. We find that they hold their, their size better. Um, they tend to unravel less and kind of unwrap and, and fall apart. So a bonker is great because it can be used as something your dogs across the room say say you don't have a prong collar say you don't have an e-collar or say you do but you don't have them on your dog you can always have a bonker with you and the bonker is very inexpensive so as an alternative for more pricey tools um, and maybe more challenging tools to develop technique with the bonker still needs some technique, but it's a very, sim very simple, straightforward uh, tool. And a lot of folks bristle at this because basically you're throwing something at your dog and we've all been conditioned and programmed that that's going to destroy, damage, you know, your dog and its abuse and all that. Um, what's great about this is that it's a very novel thing for dogs. Um, dogs are very used to things happening around their neck with all sorts of different tools, whereas this, it's novel. If you do it right, it kind of comes out of the blue. There's a startle response and it tends to de-escalate. And before we wrap up this video, I'll talk about all the different reasons why I like different tools for different things. So um, this is a great de-escalator and I'll explain in, um, in a minute why, but the, the basic protocol for this is you mark something with no because you're going to be tossing it. <clears throat> and so, if you want the dog to know what they're doing wrong, you have to mark it. And so by the very nature of this, that it's going to be tossed at your dog, then you need to mark it so your dog knows what's happening, not that just something is flying across the room. So that's the bonker. Um, works exceptionally well for certain behaviors. I'll jump into that before we close out this video. Dominant dog collars are fitted uh, what are they, nylon cord? They're not nylon, some kind of cotton cord. Um, fitted choke, and I, I even did this wrong. <sighs> fitted choke collars, like this, that's the way it goes. And then, <laughs> I need a dog. And then the leash connects to here, and then you can see it con constricts like this. So dominant dog collars will use for dogs that are highly dangerous, 
likely to come up the leash at us and we need to be able to de-escalate them immediately and keep ourselves safe. Um, they're also great for dogs that are super reactive on walks and possibly really vocal. And you can just, you can use one of these along with an e-collar and apply some mild pressure up and thus de-escalate the dog and also help with the vocalization stuff. So super good for certain things. We don't use them a ton, but they're definitely in the arsenal of uh, TGD possibilities. We've got a very green slip lead. <clears throat> you guys have all seen these, I'm sure. They've got the little locking leather goodie right here. <clears throat> we only use these to take dogs out for potties, transfer them around, location, things like that. We don't use them for any training that I can really think of. Um, I don't like the way that they transfer pressure. Um, you'll find dogs choking, hacking on them, and, and you'll have to use far more pressure to get them, to get a dog to respond to them than you would say a prong collar, which is precisely why we use, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, prong collars for training and stuff like that. So this is just to kind of introduce, we're losing our light. This is just to kind of introduce um, the tools and, and what we basically use them for, and then I'll jump into a little bit more depth. So that's the slip. We don't use it for training, even though a lot of folks love them. Just my personal thing, if you love them, love them. But we just use them to transfer dogs around, get them out of crates and things like that, super easy. Martingales, <clears throat> every dog that comes in to our facility gets a martingale. Here's a more traditional martingale, right? And you can see it's got this little loop. And basically what it does <clears throat> is, and this one's gonna be a little bit big for my hand, but the leash is connected here and it cinches. And so if it's sized right, it prevents a dog from, from backing out of the collar. So when we have dogs here, the last thing we want a dog, especially a dog that we're not sure about their safety, um, backing out of a collar and getting loose. That sounds like a very bad thing. Um, here is our own version, much cooler, um, uh, Martingale. And it's a different design and it's meant to not have as much of a loop that can get caught on things. If you notice this big secondary loop where the leash hooks is something that we get concerned about. Whereas here's a little bit of paracord and that's where your leash hooks to. And then this slides like that, creating, let's see if I can do this. It's way too big for me creating that kind of cinching. So you, you get the same cinching motion, but you, and this loop might look like, well, you still got a loop, but it's going to be against the dog, right? So you're gonna be, you're gonna have it like this, and then it's going to pull up like this. It's going to mostly stay closed rather than open up. So this is, this is our version of a Martingale. Um, I highly recommend it for any of you trainers out there that are looking to make sure you have more safety on board, no dogs backing out um, for the dog's own good, right? If you're doing like long line work at a park or something with a dog, um, you better have a collar like this on the dog because if that dog freaks out or decides to try and back out, you've got a loose dog on your hands. So, and that dog better be on a long line as well. So long line and martingale, then you've got yourself a good fighting chance at safety. Um, a dog not on a long line and not on a martingale that can back out while you're doing long distance recalls or anything like that in an open area where there's you know, no, no fences or walls, very bad idea. The aforementioned long line. And this is one of them. <laughs> There's not much to explain except that it's a long line. And so dogs that are working with us are wearing a martingale, and then this is attached to them. And this is how we typically, far more so than the slip lead, how we guide them around the facility and guide them around you know, for potty breaks and things like that. They've got the long line on, but also for training. So when we're doing training, we'll have a prong collar on the dog for initial work until we transfer just to a martingale and e-collar. There's a lot of information I'm throwing at you. But for the initial work, say the first three, four days where we're teaching sit, 
down, place, recall, thresholds, and things like that, they're either going to have a leash and prong on or they're going to have a long line and prong on. So we can share very gentle pressure, gentle information with them rather than having just the martingale and having to try and, you know, like manhandle them into some kind of position or something like that. Yes, we use food. Yes, you can use food to lure dogs and do all that stuff. But there also comes a point where you want to ensure that a dog can give to leash pressure because when you need them to give to it and they've never had to do it before, you can find yourself in a very sticky situation. So all dogs should know how to give to leash and prong pressure in my opinion. So this is the long line. Now, muzzles. Here's, um, well, they're virtually the same. I thought I grabbed two different kinds. Who needs that? Okay, so Baskerville Ultras are what we use. Once again, controversial. Why? Because as you can see, there's space here and you could get your fingers in here and get yourself bitten, right? So there's absolutely that possibility. So what we get into are trade-offs. There's Jaffco's and there's other muzzles full like metal basket muzzles that completely enclose and, and don't give the dog any possibility of biting you. Um, the problem is, is that it doesn't, they, they don't allow the dog to pant, normally breathe, drink water, eat food in the same fashion that these do. Um, some don't allow them to do it at all. So you'd have to take the muzzle off. And if you've got a dangerous dog, that sounds like a bad idea. So these are just simple Baskerville Ultras. They've got this that goes over behind, goes over and behind the neck. Um, there's also a top strap. This one doesn't have it on it, but we do use them. Top strap comes from here and goes over and connects to this strap back here. And then there's also a tab down here that if you really want to put it through the collar, you can also do that and you have a muzzle that is virtually unable to come off the dog if it's sized correctly. Um, these, you have to make sure, like they don't fit all dogs perfectly. So sometimes you have to have some in-between fits. There's also special muzzles for um, Bulldogs and Frenchies and Bostons and any, any of the flat-faced dogs, you can find those online as well. Um, so those are options for your flat-faced dogs out there. But anyways, let me get back to the Baskerville. So we prefer the trade-off that we have to be a little bit more careful about where we put our hands and not to feed the dog our fingers um, in exchange for the dogs having a more comfortable experience while wearing a muzzle, being able to pant while they work, being able to breathe very normally, being able to drink water when they need to, being able to eat or take, take kibble as we train them, but maybe don't feel safe enough to have the muzzle off of them yet. So this is what we use. You can hate us for it. You can say they're dangerous and irresponsible and all that stuff. We love them. Uh, we use them with every dog that comes in here, except for the flat-faced ones. And all the owners with dogs that have any bite history on dogs or humans or any attempts all have to have their dogs muzzle conditioned prior to coming in. Uh, so the dogs are comfortable wearing them so we can get right to work and we don't have any, you know, conniption fits with the dogs trying to get a muzzle off because they've never worn one before. Now they're under the stress of a muzzle and in a new place and their owners are leaving. You don't want that. So make sure your owners, um, if you're a trainer, make sure your owners are muzzle conditioning prior to the dogs coming to work with you, for you, for you, with you. Um, and then we have blanket yarn on here. So I don't know if you guys can see it. Marta, you tell me like how close I can get without it becoming blurry. So you can also put the blanket yarn at this point of contact. Basically, these are the most common spots where muzzles will cause abrasions to a dog's muzzle. And so um, we actually got this from a client um, back in the day and they had wrapped a blanket yarn and then just tied it off. It's a really simple, uh, uh, procedure and you can get blanket yarn at Amazon or you can get it uh, from you know, any craft store anything Walmart. like that Walmart and um, so 
this has become a, a really fantastic addition to, um, to our muzzle work because it helps prevent abrasions with dogs, especially if you have to walk a dog on a muzzle. And what ends up happening is the muzzle moves around as the dog's walking and does a bit of this or a little bit of this, right? And causes an abrasion fairly easily. This helps prevent that. And if you have a really wide-faced dog, like some of the wide-faced pitties, then putting it around here at this point also helps with any kind of abrasions here. So a fully decked out one of these has the, this first piece, this second piece, and then on both sides here in order to prevent any kind of abrasions from muzzle contact on the dog's muzzle. And also one of the side benefits of them being wrapped like this is that they tend to fit better. Right, so they, they come in and so the, the, the padding's going to give a little bit so when they're actually sitting on the dog, it actually tends, they, they tend to fit better, which is a great thing. So a lot of folks have asked us about these muzzles. Um, they think they're something special, they're not. You can order them off of Amazon. Um, you just have to do the blanket yarn stuff yourself. Um, one thing I would suggest for owners and trainers, um, once you put it on the dog, right, and say we've got our, tap, our top strap on over the top like this, as it should be. I don't know why this one doesn't have one, but over the top like this. Then before you have your owners depart, or if you're an owner, before you feel that your dog is now safely got his muzzle on, take the muzzle and give it a pull and see how far it pulls. Because what you think is snug and tight might not be at all. And you might find that the muzzle comes two, three, four inches off the dog's face like this. Maybe not all the way off the muzzle, but if the dog was so inclined to really throw a fit, they could probably get it off. And we learned that lesson the hard way back in the day. And so now we make sure every owner uh, checks this before drop off and gives it a pull and that everything is snugged up almost every time. We have to ask them to tighten this back one up and tighten the top one up and make sure it's truly snug because owners, you know, very understandably don't want it to be uncomfortable or too snug for their dogs. So they tend to go the opposite direction. So just remember any dogs that come into our program, their muzzle condition prior, um, the owners bring them in on the muzzle before they leave, we double check the fit. We make sure that they put a martingale, the owners put a martingale on the dog and fit it because we're not going to take a dog that's brand new and very likely human aggressive and be like, okay, cool. So now we're going to put a martingale right over your head and you're going to let them no, That's They're not going to like that. So have the owners do that, have them cinch up the martingale and then you can put a leash or a long line on. And now you've got a dog safe who's not going to be able to bite, can't back out of the martingale and you have control over and you can start your program safely. So that's that. Now, so I'm gonna toss this one aside. So let me just share really quickly about these tools. So there's, there's a hierarchy of typically what tools will, will cause as far as escalation versus de-escalation. And I've talked about this before, but as great as prong collars are, they will tend to amp up a dog, not always, but they will tend to amp up a dog on a walk or in any kind of situation that tends to be triggering um, more so than a lot of tools. So you have to figure out for one, are you just late to the game as far as like addressing or correcting your dog? Um, are your corrections too low? Anything like that? Or is the prong collar in and of itself amping your dog up? So you want to be super, super aware of that. I love these. Um, the reason that we went to e-collars as the primary walk tool along with these as backup is precisely because of that, which is what I'll get to next is that the e-collar tends to de-escalate far more than the prong, but the prong gives you safety that the e-collar doesn't give you. So hopefully that makes sense. This obviously gives you control and communication at a distance. So 
which is something you really can't get anywhere else. So if you want to have an awesome recall at a long distance and have it be really reliable, or you want to have your dog really awesome inside the house or the backyard, not play keep away games and things like that, this is the way to go in my opinion. Are there ways to train dogs to have great recalls? Yes. Is it dog dependent how reliable and how well that will turn out? Absolutely. It's also owner dependent, but this is your best bet as far as having the closest thing to 100% recall. Now, that said, when it comes to the walk portion of our show, um, this, when your dog tends to load up as you're walking, okay, you're, you're walking your dog and your dog wants to move out of position. Now, you could correct with a prong and that might work for your dog very well, or it might amp your dog up a little bit and get them a little jacked up, a little juiced up and a little bit moving in the wrong direction. Whereas the e-collar, not always, but much more so than the prong, tends to de-escalate and bring them back into position. Same thing goes, and maybe even more so, if your dog sees a trigger and which squirrel, cat, dog, something like that, and your dog's on a prong and your dog looks at whatever the trigger is and you say no and you correct, you might amp up your dog and a lot of folks talk about, you know, they get redirected on when they go to correct their dog, something like that. Um, most often that has to do with relationship dynamic issues, slow corrections, underwhelming corrections, bad timing in general. Um, but it can also be from a prong collar being a tool that amps up your dog. So before I can make that determination, I'd have to see you in action and see like, oh, your timing, oh, your timing's perfect. Oh, your correction's perfect. Oh, your relationship's perfect, but your dog's just not a good fit for a prong collar. Most likely it's the other stuff. Anyways, so e-collar as the primary tool for the walk is going to almost always help with putting the dog back in position without escalating them, in fact, de-escalating them. And when the dog goes to look at the trigger, it's most likely going to de-escalate and bring the dog back into position, but also relax the mindset and get them back into the mode of like, cool, we're walking, we're good, I shouldn't be looking at that. Plus, it gives you the ability to not have to get physical and start to, with a prong collar, there's a physical interaction that has to transpire in order for the mechanics to work. And I can do it in a very relaxed, nonchalant fashion because I've been doing it for a long time. See, my hand was even going behind my back because that's how I typically correct. It's just a very soft, um, very fluid motion, very easy for me. Um, but for a lot of owners, you'll see something that's more like this as they battle with the, the mechanics, how, how to do it with, a, with, with speed and enough power behind it that it actually matters to the dog. Um, that's something that's challenging for a lot of owners, which you end up getting is kind of a more of a pull and a lot of physicality, which can then jack up your dog as well, because now you're getting jacked up versus when you're using a, a an e-collar, you can just be like, nope. Oh, that didn't work. Let me dial up a little bit. Nope. Oh, that didn't work. Let me dial up a little bit. Now we're at 30. Nope. Ah, cool. My dog just went. So here's the dog. Nope, nah. Nope, as you dial up, nah. Okay, we're at 30, nope. Okay, I got it, I'm cool. So that's the difference. So you can be super, new, super neutral and nonchalant and not get your whole kind of body stuff into it, which can create problems between you and your dog. And all of a sudden, you guys are both amped up, jacked up, and then you get worse outcomes, your dog might uncork on the other dog or might uncork on your leg. So talking about tools that de-escalate, the dominant dog collar is fantastic. And I mentioned this prior for dogs that are going to come up the leash, dogs that are truly aggressive, dogs that mean you harm or dogs that are going to flip out on the walk. Um, we'll use these sometimes when I'm in my fancier mode, I'll use a prong and a dominant dog collar with two leashes because then I get the directionality and the leverage of a prong collar, but I also have the ability to de-escalate a dog who might be amping up on the walk and also remove vocalizations if I'm getting that. So a really fantastic tool that doesn't get used as much. A lot of folks use them as backups for prong collars. 
I'd recommend instead that you use a martingale and uh, one of our leashes that has a built-in backup or somebody else's leash that has a built-in backup, something like that, or the old carabiner trick, something like that. You can do it with these, totally up to you, not, not my preference. Um, so dominant dog collars, really amazing at de-escalating dogs. Um, and, and I would say in the, in the hierarchy, they're probably at the tip top of, if I had to choose one tool that was going to really guarantee me a safe de-escalation, probably this, right? So don't use them a ton, but they're there for those moments when we need them. So just, just so you guys are thinking, I want you thinking not just about how the tools can be used for different behaviors and techniques and things like that, but also the entire concept of escalation, de-escalation, right? So we've got probably number one at de-escalation. I'll get to number two in a second, um, which is the bonker. Um, number three uh, is probably the e-collar. Number four is probably the prong. So, um, and that doesn't make the prong a bad tool. It just means that in the world of escalation, if you're a gambling person, you would gamble and bet more money on the prong being the one that escalates the dog. So that said, then the bonker comes along and the bonker also, because of how it delivers pressure, that which is a lot to do with why this works a certain way, um, is that there's no constricting of a prong collar. The e-collar, which is great, doesn't have constriction, but it does have a sensation. So for some dogs, it can escalate, but it's, it's rare. Um, the dominant dog collar, although it constricts, it constricts in a very dull fashion. The dominant dog collar, you might say, well, it still constricts. Why is that such a great de-escalator? And it's because the way it does it, it doesn't do it with, um, with, with the prongs coming in, which create more kind of sensation like this. And so the bonker, because it's such a novel thing, it doesn't happen around the dog's neck or that it's not connected to the dog's body any, in any way. It creates a startle response. And if you do it right, they typically don't see it coming. So you get that startle plus they, so you get the startle of the actual, of, of the actual bonker uh, impacting with the dog. Obviously it's not going to it's, it's not going to damage the dog. It's just a, a soft towel. Um, but it's, it's fascinating that if done right with enough pressure, doesn't mean you just like drop it on them. It has to be enough pressure to where it actually does startle and it definitely has to have enough impact that the dog cares about it and prioritizes it. Doesn't mean that the dog will be injured by it. It just means they go, whoa, that was really, really concerning, right? So. And uh, like I said, as far as de-escalation tools, this is a great one. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can use it. Some of the, some of the benefits for this besides price, um, anybody's got a towel around their house, um, the, 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 the ability to use it is also very uh, straightforward and fairly simple if you just follow certain rules with marking the behavior, right? And then, then you go ahead and toss the bonker. Um, the cool thing is you can, as a trainer, um, or even as an owner in the house where maybe one of you get better behavior from the dog than the other. So like I was saying, the, the cool thing is that you can, as the, as the trainer, you can do the initial bonk for the, for, the, for the owner who's not familiar how to do the mechanics. They can say no, the bonker comes from you, so they get leverage and help from you, right? Or you can reverse it. If it's not safe for you to be close to the dog, you can have the owner say no and um, bonk the dog, and then you can slowly transfer that to you where you're able to do it if the dog is de-escalated. Um, and you can also do it where somebody in the house might not be as empowered as somebody else. And so say, say the wife really has the dog like bouncing and behaving and the husband's like, well, he always jumps on me and misbehaves and I can't get him to stop. And then the wife can do the bonker if she knows what she's doing, make that happen. And the, the husband could say, no, the wife could throw the bonker 
and then once the husband gets the hang of it, then they can do it, and then you can transfer it. So it works really well like that. Also works really well if you have a dog that likes to, as you're working through like recalls and stuff like that, wants to run to somebody else and be like, no, you can't tell me what to do. Like it's super common when dogs are, are learning recall, if they don't want to work, if they're not excited about it, if they're bratty, if they're going to try their, try their luck at like, well, maybe I don't need to do this, what they'll oftentimes do is run over to somebody, not out of fear, not out of, oh my God, I'm so beat up. They'll run to somebody that isn't giving them commands in order to see if like, do I have to do this work? You can bonk them, that the other person, the neutral person, and the dog goes, what, what do you mean? You, you too? And all of a sudden the dog's like, recalling back and forth to the, to the person that they should be because the dog has now learned that their safe person isn't so safe. So anyways, Bonker has a lot of great value um, um, and a lot of great usages. The, the real trick with this, as with all tools, but possibly more so with this than any other tool, is that you have to get there early. And by that, I mean you have to address the dog at the slightest moment of escalation. And if you don't, this will mean nothing. Why? Because it's just a soft towel. The only way it works is by having a startled response when the dog is at a very low level of just like, what was that? Bonk, right? That's the best way. Can it be used if a dog is already activated and barking and causing trouble? Yes, but it's, it's, got a, a, it's, it's far less effective in that fashion. So the real goal with this, get there early. Um, make sure that you beat the dog to the emotional punch of escalation, and this can have a great effect. Once the dog's way over threshold, this one's pretty tough to be useful for. So, and in fact, most of these tools that I've just shared are pretty useless once a dog is, is, is really escalated. You're pretty much, you've pretty much missed your moment. So anyways, that's a bunch of TGD tools, um, how we use them, why we use them, and then also talking about escalation, de-escalation, all in one video. This was supposed to be like 18 different videos and typical me, I just figured I'd just throw them all together and we'd see how they go. So hopefully this is helpful and any questions, hit me up guys um, and uh, stay safe and good luck with all of your training. All right, see ya, bye.